There is a tale in Klingon mythology of an ancient warrior who wandered the wilderness of Quonus with a thirst for honor in a dishonorable age. One day his path crossed with another who fought for honor. It was Kalos the Unforgettable. The two traveled together, sharing tales of their most glorious deeds. Kalos was so impressed by the warrior that he offered him a duty both glorious and terrible. To walk Cronus for the rest of eternity. To serve as an everlasting example of justice and valor. The warrior, being an honorable man, accepted this great burden, proclaiming, Kul wolf doth vechismo vash och mekre. Light the fire of honor in me, and I will never let it go out. The warrior's name is one that echoes through history. His name was Katinga. Centuries hence, and the name Katinga is still spoken with reverence. While most Klingons are familiar with the ancient legend, those outside the Empire have likely come to know it through its namesake, the Katinga-class battlecruiser. While today the Katinga has been relegated from its position as the premier Klingon warship, it continues to serve in the Klingon Defence Force dutifully, and in its day was regarded as the pinnacle of warship design. Today the Katinga is viewed as a living legend and as a reminder of its illustrious and honourable history. There is no other ship which can boast a heritage that is more ancient or more noble. To understand this heritage one must return to the earliest days of Klingon space travel. In the late 19th and early 20th century the Klingon people began to expand throughout their solar system, and the great houses soon realized that they would need warships to protect their new territory and assert their rule. This led, in 1919, to the construction to the first standardized Klingon starship, the D-1. While only capable of sublight speeds, the D-1 was a heavily armed battlecruiser, equipped with the most powerful weapons of its day, including Dato railguns, Mavtoch missiles, and Breath of Kalos nuclear torpedoes. The D-1 would serve as the iron fist of the Empire for many decades and was in fact still in use well over a century later as local defence skiffs. However, in 1956 the Klingons developed warp drive and a whole slew of new ships would follow as the possibility of expansion became a reality. This led to the construction of the D-2. The D-2 is something of an anomaly amongst the proud lineage of the D-series. Resembling less of a battlecruiser and more a heavily armed colony ship, the D-2 was capable only of low warp speeds, meaning that journeys between solar systems would take months, perhaps years. However, the Klingons were able to get around this issue by employing the D-2 not as a military vessel, but as a civilian vessel. The D-2 would become home to entire clans. Men, women and children all called the D-2 home, and it soon became known as Rothberg-Juan, which translates as tough old bitch, a thoroughly Klingon term of endearment to be sure. The D-2 was instrumental in the early expansion of the allowing the founding of far-flung but highly resilient colonies. The D-2 also started the tradition of Klingon houses owning their own warships. Until then, the Imperial fleet held the monopoly in naval power. While the D-2 was instrumental in expanding Klingon territory, the task of unifying and protecting these gains fell to the D-3. Launched in 2006, the D-3 would go on to serve 
as the template for all future starships of the D series, featuring the distinctive command section forward of the winged engineering section at the end of a long boom, a shape which has since become iconic of Klingon warships. While by modern standards the D3 appears rather fragile, it was in its day incredibly robust. Protected by thick polarized hull plating, the D3 was heavily armed, equipped with the new disruptors and later antimatter torpedoes, weapons that are now commonplace on Klingon warships. The D3 also proved to be a highly adaptable design. Throughout the 21st century, nearly every aspect of the systems were upgraded, from weapons to engines to environmental systems. Because of this, the D3 is recognized as one of the longest serving ships in Klingon history. However, after encountering the Vulcans in 2016 and the subsequent engagements with the powerful Vulcan fleet, the Klingon High Council resolved to replace the D3 with a new generation of Klingon warship. In the 22nd century, the Klingon Empire sought to establish itself as a major interplanetary power. However, standing between them and their goal was the mighty Vulcan fleet, which enjoyed a considerable technological advantage. However, simultaneously the Empire had large amounts of territory which needed to be protected lest neighbouring powers such as the Orions attempt to take it. Thus, the Klingon High Council faced a dilemma. Create a starship that would be able to close the technology gap with the Vulcans, but be too expensive to produce in numbers necessary to protect Klingon territory. Or they could build a simpler starship that would be numerous enough to protect Klingon territory but would do nothing to bring the Empire parity with the Vulcan fleet. Rather than decide between these options or compromise, the High Council issued requirements for both ships. This led to the construction of the D4 and D5, which coexisted and complemented one another, leading them to be nicknamed Aktung and Milota, in reference to the famous Klingon opera. The D4 was designed by the shipwright Mako of the House of Antok, a fierce warrior in, in his youth. Mako believed that strength was the highest virtue in a warrior, and that time not spent fighting should be spent drinking, a highly Klingon philosophy to be sure. This respect for strength is exemplified in the highly robust design of the D4, which is highly pragmatic, utilizing only pre-existing parts. The D4 was launched in 2126. The D4 proved to be an extremely robust and reliable workhorse, and saw service through to the end of the 22nd century. However, the D5 proved to be the more iconic of the two vessels, designed by Kree of the House of Moog, who held the belief that the highest virtue of a warrior was skill, and Krieg was known to spend hours honing his skill with the Batleth. The D5, in reflection of this, was equipped with the newest and most advanced technologies of the time, including high capacity shields, advanced tactical sensors, and new Warp 6 engines. These advanced systems allowed the D5 to serve as an incredibly effective power projection vessel and in most interactions with other races, the D5 would spearhead the encounter, showing the strength of the Klingon Empire. The D5 proved to be the most iconic Klingon vessel of the 22nd century, and even lasted into the 23rd century, where she served alongside her successor, the D6. In the latter years of the 22nd century, the Klingon Empire faced a rapidly changing Alpha Quadrant, with the aggressive emergence of the Romulan Empire, as well as increasing contact with the Orions, the Tholians and the Gorn. Not least of these developments was the founding of the Federation in 2161. However, few on the High Council truly appreciated its significance. Yet for those who did, it was clear that a more modern battlecruiser was needed, as Federation technology was developing at an exponential rate and the traditional Klingon attitude expressed in the proverb Na quap, quaf go, chag, 
in other words, do not change that which works, was no longer sufficient to ensure Klingon technological superiority. This led to the small-scale construction of the D6, which was intended to homogenize the dual roles of the D4 and 5, incorporating the best qualities of both ships into its design. The D6 has a length of 204 meters, a width of 143 meters and a draft of 54 meters. It is armed with two medium disruptors, one heavy disruptor and two torpedo tubes. The first D6s were launched in 2204 but saw limited production. Many circles in the Klingon military did not see the need for a new battlecruiser. However, in the 2230s, the Empire became increasingly aware of the expansion of the Federation, which looked to increasingly encroach on Klingon territory. Many even feared that the Federation would inspire uprisings on colonized worlds. This led to the escalation in the construction of the D6. And at the outbreak of war in 2240, the Imperial Navy boasted as many as 85 top-of-the-line D6s. In the early stages of the war, the D6 proved more than capable of dispatching the slow, ungainly and underpowered ships of Starfleet, to such an extent that the Klingons utilized the strategy of least respect, known as Vochawitwutu. However, Starfleet proved more resourceful than anticipated, and new ships such as the Ares and eventually Constitution class would show the D6 to be increasingly outdated, and while work did go into the replacement, it would see little progress before the ceasefire in 2244. The development of this replacement would be further delayed as a new age of feudalism took hold. Ancient feuds between great houses re-emerged and the empire broke down into a state of near civil war and the imperial fleet would be left in dry dock as their crews deserted them to join their houses. During this period, much of the imperial fleet was simply forgotten and left to decay, all broken up and cannibalized their parts used to retrofit the ancient hereditary flagships of the Great Houses. These ships would go on to see service in the Klingon Federation War of 2256, in which the D-Series was notably absent. While the Klingons were ultimately defeated in the war, it led to the outcome its instigator, the Marta Kuvma, sought reunifying the Empire and galvanizing it against the Federation. The new Chancellor Lorel, in a bid to gain support and popularity for her regime, revived the battlecruiser program, placing it under the supervision of her advisor, Vok, son of Nun, under the capable leadership of Vok, who also possessed intimate understanding of Federation starships, the battlecruiser was launched within the year. However, before he could see the fruits of his labour, Volk was assassinated in an attempted coup, and so he was fated never to see his vision fulfilled in the D7. The D7 was, and is to this day, regarded as the ultimate expression of the Klingon battlecruiser. The ship proved to be more compact and agile than its Federation rival, the Constitution. Measuring in at a lean 228 meters long, the D7 also possessed a formidable armament consisting of eight disruptors and two torpedo launchers. However, this does not weigh her down in any way. The D7 can reach a competitive warp 8 and possesses superior acceleration. Launched in 2257, the D7 proved to be a thoroughly modern warship. However, none at the time realized the true extent of its longevity, lasting into the 24th century. Many have argued that this stems from the fact that the D7 is a ultimately and fundamentally a good design. Certainly, it is a view that many Klingons subscribe to, arguing that it is the Batleth of starships. Indeed, this argument would go on to convince many even far beyond the borders of the Empire, the Romulans having purchased several as part of a technology exchange in the 2260s. 
Indeed, nearly a hundred years later, the Federation would be gifted a D7 as a sign of alliance, and the ship would be christened the USS Gorkon, and would serve as a museum ship. The D7 would become the defining symbol of the Empire in the 23rd century, and much like her rival, the Constitution, the D7s would undergo a life extension refit in the 2270s, now referred to as the Katinga refit, an extremely apt description. The Katinga class saw improvements to weapons and armour. This makes it distinguishable from the D7 through its ornate hull plating. In the late 2280s, the idea of a successor to the D7 began to circulate, as in many in the Empire sought for a ship that could counter the new Federation Excelsior class. However, in 2293, the Empire was shaken to its very core by the Praxis disaster, and subsequently all military projects were mothballed. However, the Contingo continued to serve dutifully, unfazed by the surrounding turmoil. The Katinga would continue its service into the 24th century, though by the latter half it assumed more of a support role. However, they continued to be venerated and respected culturally. And the Katinga would go on to prove that its fighting days were far from over, seeing action in wars with the Cardassians, the Federation, and the Dominion. By this time, the Katinga had undergone yet another refit to make it serve more effectively in a combat support role. This took the form of replacing the prow torpedo launcher with a heavier lance phaser, making it more suited to providing long-range fire support. The Katinga served well as a veteran warship and continues to see service in the Klingon Defense Force, and it is a ship that has subsequently seen service in many other militaries. The Katinga is, to this day, seen by many as the standard against which all other Klingon ships are judged, and it is a testament to the virtues of rugged and reliable Klingon design, with some vessels being more than a hundred years old. More than that, it is the culmination of more than 400 years of design lineage, and has earned its mythical nomenclature. The Katinga is the very embodiment of the warrior everlasting, and will go on to be remembered as the everlasting battle cruiser.